Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for the Sunday morning service of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word from Pastor Paul Gunn. The title of my message today is Paul's Revolutionary News to the Church. I'll be preaching from Ephesians chapter 5, and I'll pique your interest here by pointing out in advance that this is the wives submit to your husbands as unto the Lord chapter. Some of you men have been waiting for me to get to that chapter, haven't you? (laughs) Better not be any amens there, right? But uh, I want to handle this passage with grace and with with truth and boldness as, as the scripture teaches it. Paul's revolutionary news to the church. The three points of my message today are God's example helps us know the way. Second, holy living is a byproduct of being light in the world. And three, marriage is a symbol of Christ and his church. As I continue in the sermon series from Ephesians, we learn that Paul used the earlier part of his letter to build a case here on confrontation. He confronted the Christians there at the church at Ephesus. But Paul didn't just walk in most of the time and and confront people. He usually built a case to get to the point he wanted to make. One of the main thrusts of Ephesians was for people to know who they are in Christ and to live accordingly. And today, That theme continues in Ephesians chapter 5. First, God's example helps us know the right way. This may sound like a statement that uh, is nothing more than stating the obvious, but indeed as believers we must continue to evaluate whether our own actions follow God's example. Read with me in verse 1 of chapter 5. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly beloved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Well, be imitators of God means following God's example. And following God's example should be the preface of every topic in our lives. It should also be the preface to every topic in this chapter. So when we come up on a particular topic, we'll ask ourselves, or we'll preface it by saying, following God's example. Because God doesn't ask us to do anything that's not right, since he's a holy God. Christ was God incarnate. So to put it on real practical terms, how do we know if we're following God's example? Well, we we know that we're following God's example if we follow Christ's example. And if we do that, everything will be okay. In this chapter, Paul deals with immorality, impurity, greed, language, wise living, moderation, and husband and wife relations. If we start out by following Paul's first instruction here, let me say it one more time, to follow God's example, then we'll have a healthy framework from which to learn and discuss Ephesians chapter 5. But so many times people like to take phrases and build entire teachings and doctrines or even denominations around a handful of phrases without looking at the rest of the scripture. Let's talk more about following God's example. Look in verse 3. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Sexual immorality, impurity, and greed are lumped together in one sentence. Paul lumps these three types of bad language together. And he says to trade them for thanksgiving. Paul tells us the results of unholy living in verse 5. For this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater, 
has any inheritance in the kingdom of uh, Christ and of God. And then Paul tells us the results of unhealthy words. Verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Paul's admonition to be alert and to not fall into deception immediately follows the sins that he mentions, sexual sins, impurity, greed, and language. And I believe he did this because people who fall into deception typically fall into one of these sins. Modern day people, us, our problems and our temptations seem to be very much like the problems and temptations of the people of ancient Ephesus. I believe it was Solomon who said that there was nothing new under the sun. So a couple of thousand years later, we have a society that still deals with these sins and falls into these sins. So God's example helps us know the right way. And second, holy living is a byproduct of being light in the world. Look in verse 8. For you were once darkness. You know, he doesn't say you were once in the darkness. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the world. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth. Verse 10. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. Verse 13. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. That uh, last section is a paraphrase of Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1, expressing a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy through Christ. Paul's words come to us following chapter 4, where he told the Gentiles, the people who were the majority, the people who lived in Ephesus, to quit acting like Gentiles. It was expected that Gentiles lived as heathens with no moral compass, but God told the Gentiles Now that they were believers and followers of Jesus Christ, they had a new way to live. In other words, Paul was telling them they were to put on Christ, a whole new way of living. Coming to faith in Christ is not like a one-day event that you go and do and then you remember for the rest of your life. This was revolutionary news to the people at the church of Ephesus. They had a new purpose for living. And therefore, they should live under a new disposition. They should have new attitudes and outlooks on everything. Look in verse 15. Paul says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When I heard this verse as a child, speak to each other with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, it sounded to me like living an opera. How are you today? I am fine, praise the Lord. That's what it sounds like, doesn't it? Paul is talking about here a completely different attitude and way of living because of Christ. I hope that you have an attitude, a Christ-like attitude for everything that happens in your life. I hope that Christ to you is not just a historical figure that you hear about, that you read about, that you learn trivia about, but I hope that he is the living Savior in your life 
that gives you a completely new and different outlook on everything. The Gentiles. Paul told them to quit living like other Gentiles because they were now Christians. In this chapter, Paul proposes several trade-offs. And now that the Gentiles at Ephesus know Christ, Paul told them in these scriptures to trade darkness for light. He told them to trade lack of wisdom for wisdom. He, tro he told them to trade folly for seeking God's will. And he told them to trade drunkenness and raucous living for Holy Spirit living. That's four trade-offs that I saw that Paul mentions here in uh, chapter 5. There may be more. Let's review. God's example helps us know the right way. Uh, holy living is a byproduct of being light in the world. And third, marriage is a symbol of Christ and his church. We get to this important part in Scripture. And we have verses 22 through 24 talking to wives. Then we have verses 25 through the rest of the chapter talking to husbands. So I've decided this morning to reverse the order and I want to speak to husbands first. Are you ready husbands? I didn't hear much from that. If Paul were writing today, perhaps he would reverse the order and cover the husband section first. I don't know. But I want you to notice that the section about husbands is about three times as long, more than three times as long as Paul's instruction to wives. And while it's been a while since I heard anyone preach from this chapter, uh, I feel as if the scripture to wives is the one which gets the focus and the scripture to the husbands is treated more as an afterthought. Let's look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. We know the story of the life of Christ. We know why he came. We know that he set the example of holiness. He led a blameless life and he gave his life on the cross for those who would believe in him, those who are called the church. We know that Jesus was completely unselfish. There was not a selfish breath that he ever breathed. There was not a selfish cell in his body. How many husbands make their entire existence all about sacrifice for their wives? That's what it's talking about here. Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave up himself for her. If Paul said nothing more than this one verse, we husbands would have our work cut out for us, wouldn't we? But he goes on explaining more about Christ's relationship to his church. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I'll read that again. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. I believe that we're safe in saying several things about Christ and his relationship to us, the church. We would say he is patient. He is kind. He never gives up. Christ, as he relates to us, his bride, the church, he's constantly challenging us to have more faith and to be more like him. He's constantly building us up. Obviously, most of the time, we, as the bride of Christ, fall miserably short, don't we? Paul talks about Christ washing with the word of God, creating a beaming and beautiful church 
which is, as he says, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In other words, listen to me, men. Christ works with his church, his bride, to help her become what she needs to become. He works with, her, with his bride, the church, to make her beautiful. Christ works with his bride, the church, to make her confident to carry on his work. Christ works with his bride, the church, because he loves the church. Husbands, how does that relate to your relationship with your wife? Let me ask you, husbands, when was the last time you told your wife you loved her. If you don't do that on a regular basis, then you need a good swift kick in the pants. When was the last time your actions to your wife expressed your love for her? If you don't do it every day, then you need a good second swift kick in the pants. When was the last time you worked with your bride and you helped her to become the beaming and beautiful person that she wants to become? Or do you spend your time putting her down, pointing out her flaws? If that's you, then guess what? You don't deserve your wife. So husbands... You have an assignment straight from the scripture to love your wives as Christ loved the church so much so that he gave up his life for the church. Hopefully I'm not speaking to any husband here. Hopefully your wives are nudging you and saying, I'm so glad he's not talking about you. Verse 28. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. We should care for our wife's well-being as much as we care for our own. Verse 31, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. I realize that I'm speaking to a lot of older husbands here. Husbands that I can learn from and do learn from. And I realize I'm speaking to older husbands whose parents are already deceased. But I'm sure there are some younger husbands here who need to hear this and here it is. Husband, your father and your mother should not be directing your marriage. They need to stay out of it. And it's your responsibility to keep them out. If you have a father and mother who's trying to direct your marriage, your work is cut out for you. Deal with it. And protect your wife from your own parents if you have to. Perhaps they're trying to direct your marriage because you're not man enough to direct it without them. If so, again, deal with it. And for any single men listening to me today, do not get married unless you are willing to heed the advice from Scripture to leave your mother and father and become one flesh with your wife. About three years ago, a young couple that who do not come to this church, came to see me. They were engaged to be married, and they were having problems in their engagement. I listened as the woman of the couple expressed her concerns about her soon-to-be mother-in-law. It was clear to me that the man's mother was way too involved in his life as an adult, and he was really not strong enough to take care of himself or take care of the problem. And in our meeting... He defended his mother over and over in front of his fiancée. 
And I came up with a solution for them after about two hours of hearing it. Don't get married. You know, it wasn't what they wanted to hear, but then again, my advice was free. In verse 32, Paul reminds us once again that in this marriage relationship, he's talking about the church. Verse 32, this is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. I'd say most people, most Christians, probably 99% of Christian married couples have no clue whatsoever that marriage is a picture of Christ as the groom and the church as the bride. Did you know that? If you've never heard it before, you've heard it now. So 100% of everyone here should know that marriage is a picture of Christ as the groom and the church as his bride. And someday when he, Christ returns, he's going to take his bride. Then Christ and his church will become like husband and wife. Paul explained it best when he said, this is a profound mystery. We don't understand it. Now let's go back and read the section that I skipped. Verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Isn't it interesting how Paul started out this section on submission this way? And now that the husbands have had their instruction, here's the instructions for the wives. Verse 22, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he's the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Well, after I beat up on the men, this scripture to wives seems pretty simple, doesn't it? I believe, listen to me here, if husbands love their wives as Christ loved the church, if husbands realize that their existence is to build up their wives like Christ builds up the church. If husbands love their wives so much that they'd be willing to lay their lives down like Christ did for the church, then verses 22 through 24 would happen naturally. Let's look at the day and age in which Paul wrote this. Women, by and large, throughout the world were treated as property. And when Paul said to the believers to quit acting like Gentiles because they now through Christ had a new perspective on everything, he also meant it in the marriage relationship. He was telling these Gentile men who had been raised a different way, your women are no longer properties. You are to serve your wives. You are to love them like Christ loved the church. Now, if you don't know the history of the day in which Paul was writing, then you might be confused here. But women were treated as second, third, last class citizens. Paul elevated the status of wives by challenging men to love them as Christ loved the church. Now, some of you might, like, might not like what I'm about to say, but from my experience, I can tell you that it's true. In my 30 years in the ministry, I've encountered a few, not many, but a few that I would consider women out of control. And all they did was stir up things and dominate. In each case, 100% of the time, the husband was terribly weak. In the years of not being loved by her husband, and the years of not being built up by him, were manifest by being dominant and out of control in the church. The root issue went back to the husband. The status of women has changed since Paul wrote to the church. Back then, there were no women doctors, no women educators, no women airline pilots. When I was at the Air Force Base a couple of weeks ago, I met women training to be fighter pilots. That didn't happen in Paul's day. 
And it's highly possible, as with other, Paul's other epistles, that he wrote to the church at Ephesus about specific problems. And it's highly possible, or more even probable, that the problem he was writing about was wives out of control because their husbands were not loving this, loving them. And the reason I say this is because Paul wrote another letter to the church, church at Galatia. And in chapter 3 of Galatians, verse 16, he said, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. So Paul says this in, Eph in Ephesians. He says uh, uh, another statement in Galatians, and some people could argue that it's a contradiction. I don't think so. And while I believe there's validity to these scriptures in Ephesians about submission, we have to remember that Paul did say to submit to one another there in Ephesians. But he talked about an order and he talked about a comparison between Christ and his church. We also have to look at the day in which Paul gave his instruction. I believe that the overall spirit, the overall context of this scripture is a spirit of love and Christ-likeness, not ownership and domination. I hope you agree with me on this. I hope the men still like me after today's sermon. You know, one thing I like about being a man is we can argue then go to lunch together. My, my, Susan just can't figure out how men are able to do that, right? But uh, men will disagree and then start talking about sports or cars or whatever, and then it's like the disagree. We can compartmentalize our disagreements. But this morning, husbands, if any of you need to talk to me about the the message this morning, come and see me. And the title of my message here, God's Revolutionary News to the Church at Ephesus. This was indeed revolutionary when Paul told the people these things, especially when he told men to love their wives as Christ loved the church, which I've said about a hundred times here, I realize. They probably had never heard it before. And Paul's letter to them was intended to bring order and help the men to step up to the plate and set a godly example. Today I've preached to you the truth from, from Ephesians chapter 5. Paul talks about this holy living as light, as the Holy Spirit helps us. This doesn't mean that any of us are perfect, but it does mean that we are forgiven that we can start over every day in Christ. If you've never repented of your sin and received Jesus, you are not living life to its fullest. You're just living life. Let's stand together. We'll sing one verse of our invitation hymn. If you want to come to Christ today, or if you want to come forward for any other reason, we'll be waiting for you. <laughs>